And what's up? I know I'm crazy audience. This is your host, Naja Hall with I Know I'm Crazy. This is Podcast Tuesday, and we have a guest here that I am so privileged and honored to be able to bring to you all. So I have Mr. Charles Robinson, attorney, mediator, Charles L. Robinson here. Now, he and I met online. I think it's been a couple years. And let me tell you how bold Mr. Robinson is. I think I put my phone number maybe in the signature of my email or something somewhere. And he had reached out to me like, hey, Naja, I like what you're doing. And I responded, of course, because I, his credentials, wait till I tell you guys about them. I responded, of course. And Mr. Charles was like, you know what? I ain't waiting. I don't know how you millennials do it, but I ain't going to wait on this young lady to hit me back. So I'm walking down the street in Manhattan one day and he's like, hey, Naja Hall, this is Charles Robinson. So, well, hello, Mr. Charles. <laughs> so over the years, he and I have developed a bond over our shared um, love and fight for people in blended families, people dealing with conflict of all different sorts. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about him right after this dance break. So hang on, let me pay some bills real quick. And I'll be right back to tell you all about Charles L. Robinson. I know I'm crazy. I know I'm crazy. I know I'm doing crazy. Charles Robinson has extensive training and experience in labor employment law and mediation. A graduate of the University of Wisconsin Law School, he's a former administrative law judge and special master for the Milwaukee County Circuit Courts. He's managed disputes for universities, prisons, schools, governmental agencies, everybody. He also provides training workshops and seminars for schools, businesses, community groups also. His mediation practice has an emphasis in family, court, matters for more than three decades. Mr. Charles Robinson, I can say I'm looking at you right now. And for those of you guys that want the audio visual experience, you can come and you just look at the link below. You can come and see us. Mr. Charles Robinson don't look like he's been doing nuts for 30 years. Mr. Robinson, you look good. You look good. <laughs> So over the course of his professional career, Charles has been an adjunct professor teaching part-time in the schools of human services and continuing professional services while teaching with a commitment to transform socioeconomic conditions and violence in his community. He's been an active volunteer and community leader. His work includes creating book clubs, serving as district commissioner for the Boy Scouts of America, providing mediation training for the police department, facilitating peace circles for block cubes, facilitating listening circles for youth and police officers, and serving as a program leader with a landmark worldwide, a personal with professional training and development corporate corporation mr charles now what do i call you because you know I, I feel like just you know i'm a southern girl and out of respect i should call you mr charles but what do i call you don't call me mr charles i'm not that old oh. <laughs> you can call me charles you just you've been a judge you've done so much in your life i kind of feel like i should you know it feels okay i'm gonna call you charles just for the um purposes of this podcast but i'm gonna tell you everything in my genetic makeup is not to call you by your first name i'm gonna just tell you that so he's giving me permission to call him charles so thank you so much for being here today charles thank you finally yes we get to sit down and talk and yeah, my friends call me charlie robs you can call me charlie robs charlie robs <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rob. So the one thing I always like to do is when somebody comes on the podcast, obviously I've just told everybody all of your professional accolades, but tell us a little bit about your story. Why did you become a mediator? Why are you fighting um, for people to learn how to peacefully resolve conflict? Well, <clears throat> my mediation practice started after law school and I worked in several jobs and realized that you know, I really didn't like making somebody right, making somebody wrong. You know, the old arcane legal system that we inherited from, from Europe, of course, uh, which means that A wins and B loses. And when I discovered uh, mediation, it actually through, through labor and employment law, I got access to 
alternative dispute resolution or mediation arbitration. So there were some mm -hmm. other things that I found that I could do within the legal system um, rather, you know, other than litigation, because I didn't like the idea of chasing ambulances. Yeah. But, but the reason the, the reason I got into I went to law school in the first place was because I was a school teacher in a classroom in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I was the first teacher to graduate from this junior high school. They call it middle school now. But I was mm -hmm. the first teacher to graduate from this school to go back and teach there. Wow. When I went back to teach there. I realized that there was so much systemic and, and structural racism that yeah. was, a, you know, it wasn't apparent to me when, as a student. But we had 1,600 students in a building that had the capacity of 900. So, so you had, were overcrowded and under-resourced, obviously. So there were fights, you know, you know, mm -hmm. there was not very much learning going on. I took advantage of my education well enough to, you know, ultimately make it in law school. My high school was was much different. And but anyway, make a long story short, I got so frustrated after teaching for two years. I decided that I'm going to stop. I was working on a master's degree in school psychology and I didn't complete. I said, I'm going to go to law school and come back and run for school board. Right. Because <laughs> I oh, wait a minute. To... Wait a minute. Yeah. Charlie Rob, you <laughs> said I'm going to I'm in the classroom. I'm making a pretty OK salary right now. I'm also getting my master's, but I'm going to drop all this and I'm going to go to law school because I want to affect the affect change in a different way. Right, exactly. And I was actually playing professional basketball with the Central State Football League. Wait and a minute, you just see, you've done so much. Hold on now. That's not even in your bio. You what? what? The Green what Bay Packers, here? the Green Bay Packers offered me a tryout. What? Right? <laughs> because one of the scouts, uh, Elijah Pitts was at one of the games I played. Yeah. And you know, I had a pretty good game and so he he uh, gave me an offer to, to try out, but I went to law school instead. Okay. Okay. I was kind of upset too, because my dream was to graduate and go back and teach and coach at my alma mater. Right. Mm. So, but I couldn't get transferred from this junior high school that hired me because of a, a union management situation where you have to teach for three years before you could actually transfer. How was that be? They got and you. I had a coaching position at my alma mater. I was I would have been the assistant football coach and track coach. And I was just so upset. That was another reason why I quit teaching and and went back and went to law school. And OK. And so and then after that, after I got in law school, I realized, hey, I don't want to practice law. I don't like this, <laughs> you know, because I'm someone who loves peace and harmony. Yes. And, and uh, law is anything but though. Yeah. And I found my niche as a mediator after uh, after a couple of years, you know, working as, as administrative law judge. And I ended up working in a prison environment. So and, you were also an administrative law judge. Um, you, you were on the bench. You were presiding over cases in that case. That's yeah, what that but, means. Yeah. But, you know, they, they, it was quasi legal cases. It, it wasn't like I'm a judge, you know, with a robe and all of that. Administrative, oh. law, administrative law judges are a little different, kind of like court commissioners. What's that? You know, oh, you don't have a gavel. No, I didn't have a gavel or anything like oh, that. Okay, we can but, we can skip past this part. <laughs> oh. I, I but administrative was, uh, law judge in the in the equal rights division, and so I okay. would reside over cases and controversy in, involving discrimination cases. Okay. As it, so you were to, as it related to employment discrimination. Gotcha. Gotcha. So then you, so at this point, I don't know, can you tell us the ages you were? Cause I'm trying to like put this in chronological order because professional football player, um, master's degree dropout, then law school, then judge, and then mediator. So at this point, do you feel comfortable telling ages or numbers or years? Because I'm trying to help. I'm trying to understand okay, my me, own chronology. Okay. 1971 is Damn. is when I graduated from college, right? And then I taught for two I'm years. Born, I'm born then, Charlie Ross. <laughs> <laughs> so I taught for two years, and then after teaching <laughs> for two years, I went back to school. I went to law school, and in 1976 
before you were born, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I still I, I wasn't here yet. I still I, wasn't here yet. <laughs> wow. And I graduated from law school and then you I were uh, grown, grown before I even was <laughs> thought of. That's okay though. That's all right. We're here now. We're here now. That's okay. And so my first job right out of law school was that I was an administrative law judge. The the EEOC had a four-year backlog of cases. And our state agency, you know, had a had a contract with the EEOC. Well, that's perfect then. So that's a job for you because you got to clear up these cases. Right. So I didn't I didn't run for school board. I ended up taking the job as a ministry of law judge. Yeah. And, and I did I never actually uh, you know went to you know I, I had a problem with public speaking. I didn't think I was good at public speaking, so I didn't run for school board. People but you know what? <laughs> yeah. That's probably for you know what I kind of see is the trajectory of our lives. Things uh-huh. kind of happen how they're supposed to. Mm-hmm. That's one thing that I've learned. Um, because I have some things, you know, I used to call them regrets, and now I'm just like, eh, it just it, it just, just wasn't the direction it I wasn't was holding. The time. Right. It wasn't the time, or you know, like I always said, I was like, if God would have gave me a singing voice and made me a rock star, I would have been overdosed. Because that's my personality. I would have just been overdosed. I'd be okay. dead. Oh, my God. Naja would have been a memory. Oh, my God. I said, but God don't give you everything because he knows exactly what you can and cannot handle. But so you know, when, the, uh-huh. I, have, I have to tell you this, though. Yes. In 1969, before I graduated from college, we had an a incident on campus. And I was like put into this, this um, incident where there, there was a, a fight on campus between a, a white fraternity and some black guys who were playing in an intramural, intramural basketball game. Oh, and, my husband got in one of those fights between was, the Pikes and the, and the Kappas. <laughs> yeah, well, Damn, mm-hmm. it's always the white frats and the black frats fighting. And, you know, I, um, I was suspended from school, lost the whole academic year, my best mm-hmm. year. Like I had like a 3.6 or 7 coming so um, you were fighting letters. or you were like driving. I was sitting in a graduate level uh, evening sc- uh, course. It was it was a class that met from 630 to 9 o'clock. While the incident was happening, I'm sitting in class, a class interviewing counseling techniques, right? Mm-hmm. With, 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 it was a graduate level course. I had special permission because I was a psych major. You were an undergrad, but yeah, you undergrad. were sitting in a grad level course. Yeah, I had special Dang. permission. Right? I was barely making it then. You just <laughs> have always been stellar. <laughs> but so, so the next day after the incident, and there was a retaliation incident at this white fraternity's frat house. And I, when I heard about what was about to happen, I ran down to the scene. I was too late. They'd already invaded this house and everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, a police officer saw me and they said, Stand he assumed that you were me. part of it. Right, mm-hmm. right. Well, he, he, I was the only black guy on the football team for three years, right? And we were, we were nationally ranked, right, <laughs> among the top two. We had the bowl bid to go to Florida for the national bowl. And then we lost the last game of the year, so we couldn't go. But so I, I was the only black guy on the team for three years. So everybody knew me, right? Yes, I had so, to have known, like, no, this is the good black kid. This isn't a troublemaker. Well, but then, you know, you see black what, skin and you think, tr- you know, we, we know the inherent bias well, the that cops, comes along. The cop was looking out for me. The, the police officers are standing over here with me because Perk wouldn't, you know, the, the, the head football coach name was Perkins. He said, Perk wouldn't want you to be involved in that. So yes. I had, so the next day, oh, I, was okay. surprised. I was surprised my name was among the list of 16 people who were just summarily suspended from school and no trial, no, no, chance no due to speak process. Up for no, just suspended from school. And then we were now, uh, now I'm gonna two, say two felonies and a misdemeanor I was facing. <laughs> Wait a minute. So, but, but let me tell you what happened. I couldn't go to any public school in the state, and because I was gonna, I was going to try to get in UWM. And you're like, let me just transfer then, since I'm kicked out of this school. Let me transfer. Couldn't go to any public school. Couldn't transfer because of politics. So I ended up going to Marquette, Marquette University, which was you know a private Catholic school. Mm-hmm. They let me in one semester there. I got back into Whitewater, uh, which is where my, you got suspended from. Right. 
Okay. You drink white water. So I got. Wait, that. I do have a question. Hold on. Mm-hmm. So when you got suspended along with the sixteen other guys, so that means like we're talking black and white guys got suspended, right? It wasn't just a whole bunch of black dudes that got kicked no, out. No, all all black people, all black guys. Damn. Any of the white boys got kicked out? No. No. Y'all hear this? Hey, listen, audience, <laughs> and most of my audience is white here. Y'all see how this shit happens, right? Y'all, y'all, y'all see. Like we don't, we don't just make these things up. And you, yeah, I want y'all to just listen. Like I'm for a lot of you guys. I'm Naja is your only black friend, and so uh, y'all think I'm one of the good ones. But listen, this is how things happen. Sixteen but, black but boys Naja, got kicked out. But this was perfect because mm-hmm. it led me into self development. Yes. I didn't want to become bitter. By the way, I got back into Whitewater and took a summer session and graduated, still graduated in four and a half years. Mm. I had one year of eligibility for playing football and I chose not to. I, I took yeah. the teaching job instead, right? So you're like, you know what? I think football is, I think I'm done with that. You're like, it's, I can hang it up. Well, well until would, the until the Milwaukee Bucks, wait, who was that they called you? The Green Bay the, Packers. The Green, oh, the, so, the so Green Bay on, Packers. So I went on and graduated, took the job teaching. While I was teaching, Elijah Pitt's uh, wife was teaching in the same school and in, in the same building with me. Now, so I don't know Elijah Pitt. Elijah Pitt, see, you, you're so young. He's a legendary, <laughs> um, you know, Hall of Fame football player who played okay. years ago. Okay, and, okay. And he became a, a, a scout for the Green Bay Packers. Nice. So his, his wife was um, teaching in the same building with me. Right. Mm-hmm. So they came to the game and then that's how I got discovered by the Green Bay Pack. Love how because see, I just tried to take it down like a, a sociopolitical racial thing. And yeah. I love how you took what I was just trying to do and turned it around and was like, wait a minute, Naja, I didn't become bitter from that. I like how you did that. <laughs> just, you know, that's that mediation stuff working. You aha, uh-huh, you work some of that mediation juju on me. I like how you did that though. I just wanted to note that. So Elijah Pitts noticed you and Right. And so I I didn't accept the offer to try out. And I went to law school instead. And then when I got to law school, I decided I don't really like this either, but I went on and completed. Right. Mm-hmm. And then ultimately I found my niche as a mediator. Right. But along the way, I'm still dealing with this this traumatic experience. I didn't realize it was affecting me so much yeah. until uh, 53 years later, I'm, I'm writing a memoir about this, by the way. Mm. And I know you don't want to interview me about, about all of this stuff. because this wanna, not, I want to know about everything. You're, I'm so curious about you. No, no, listen, I'm so curious about everything that you do. And I'm such a fan of everything you do. Um, you know, whatever you want to share, I feel like it's going to be advantageous for not only me, but for the entire listening audience. So well, you, you're brilliant. You're just beautiful. Thank you and so brilliant. much. Wow. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for allowing me to share this because last week while I'm writing this memoir mm-hmm. and I decided to write an open letter as and, and, and put the open letter to the football team because, you know, we were, were champ conference champions for three years. Then we were like nationally ranked. I'm the only black guy, but there was, I had this one guy on the team who I could relate to really well, Greg Jones. He was two time All American, you know, um, wow. Division, Division Three. And I hadn't talked to Jonesy in um, like 50 years, over 50 years. Mm-hmm. And I decided that, you know, when I was writing this open letter, I became overwhelmed with emotion. And I, I realized that I was traumatized and didn't realize I was traumatized. But now, you know, I'm creating this, you know, conflict matters for families. That's how I got in touch with you. I'm learning more and more about trauma in the body and how it manifests. Oh, Mm. it hit me. Hit you like a ton of bricks. So I said, what did I do about this? So I, I, I found Greg Jones's email because he had emailed me about five years ago. Yeah. For, for a we had a reunion of all the undefeated teams. And, and you've just so, done so much in your life. Like, God, wow. And guess what? He said, and see, he lived in the frat house that got invaded. Right? He knew you got kicked out for that BS and knew you had nothing to do with it. Well, I wasn't sure what he knew. Oh, so okay. When I contacted him. Uh, 
the next he said sure he'd like to meet and then the next morning he emailed me and said he could hardly sleep because he was re you know he's he was re-experiencing the melee that happened so he's traumatized but too he's traumatized too and see I was wait a minute so you're like this white frat dude who still got to stay in school who's all american he's traumatized too with black charles who got his butt kicked out and had his almost his education derailed so wait a minute yeah. both of these dudes are traumatized well see jonesy you know he had he uh he got drafted by the denver uh denver broncos right yeah and you know he he didn't last too long with the Denver Broncos. So he ended up okay. playing against me in the Central States Football League, right? Oh, cool. <laughs> so he was playing for the Delavan Red Red Wing Devil uh, Red Devils. Devil mm -hmm. Delavan Red Devils. You don't have to tell me, you don't have to remember. And, I, I, and I was playing for the West Elf. But anyway, so I only know the NFL teams because I don't right, know the right. other this, ones. This is wasn't the NFL. But I know. um but you know, we would see each other and and for a couple of years we'd handshake at the end of the game. But we yeah. really never got a chance to talk about the incident that happened on December 16th, 1969. And, wow. And so um he said he wanted to meet. And so we met uh last week, Tuesday, in Cedarburg, Wisconsin. And um we met for lunch. Nobody touched the food, right? We just talk, talk, talk for three hours <laughs> yeah. straight. Now his yeah. wife wants to meet me. So we're going to hook up again for for um, pizza next week, right? Whoa. But he was able to share with me that the fight that happened at the gym wasn't even the Phi Chi Epsilon fraternity. It was another group, but somebody thought it was the Phi Chi's. And so wow. they got together. They had a meeting at the Black Student Union and decided to go down and confront the five and destroy guys. destroy that house. And that wasn't right. even them. Because there were two sisters involved. There were two women involved in the melee at the gym. And so that's why the retaliation was so profound. Does your partner share kids with a loony? Are your stepkids driving you up a wall? Is your partner failing miserably at setting boundaries? Well, VIP Stepmom is where you need to be. We're an exclusive private community just for stepmoms, and we'd love for you to join our tribe. Each month, our members enjoy private conversations, podcasts, expert workshops, a subscription to Stepmom Magazine, and monthly live Zoom meetings. If you're ready to join a diverse community that is committed to making sure you live your best life, visit VIP Stepmom today. We'll save a seat for you. VIP, VIP, Stepmom, that's you and me. Yeah, they're like, hold on, women, you, women were hurt in this, right. and <sighs> right. But then, in talking to Jonesy, Jonesy was telling me the other part of the story was that was not the Five Chi Epsilon team that this black freshman group was playing against. It was an independent uh, team. Whoa! So, so it, was, it wasn't even them. It wasn't even them. It was they got the smoke and they didn't even do anything? They didn't even do anything, right? So. I um I'm still, you know, I'm gonna complete You're still unpacking letter. like the, all of this stuff. I'm gonna write the open letter and I'm gonna include what I just shared with you in the open letter as well. Mm. Because the open letter 53 years later. Yeah, yeah. See, my life purpose, I got in touch with my life purpose, which is peace, healing, and collaboration. Mm -hmm. And so I took my legal training and um and all of the things I've done in life. And I, when I look back, I see that from two and a half years old, that's who I've been. Like, I, I recognize myself as a peacemaker, as someone who intervenes, someone who... Um, hey, I have to ask, what is your astrological sign? Like, not that I believe in that I'm, stuff, I'm, but I... I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a Libra. Libra. See, yeah, see, you Libra, that's a skate. And my mom is a Libra, so yeah. you're about balance. You're yeah. about achieving synergy and balance. Okay. Yes. I see. I see. That's a great exactly. career for you. Not that and I, I believe born, in that stuff. And I was born on a Monday. So if you if you go with the Afro Afrocentric. What uh, does that mean? Birthday. I don't know. I when I went to Ghana for my birthday last summer, I'm I was born on Wednesday. So they they named me Akia, Aquia, and Tony. I'm, I'm Quojo. You Quojo? Okay, wait. Since Tony is Kwame. Okay. And I'm Aquia. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Kojo is born on what day? Monday. Monday. 
Oh, okay. Monday's your culture. Okay, cool, cool, cool. That's awesome. So look, can we, I just want to go back real quick because, okay. you know, you said 53 years ago, you were reliving this incident that literally seemingly derailed where you wanted your life to go. And obviously you landed in the right place. You landed on your feet, but you're like, oh my God, I'm traumatized. So I don't think we know that we can, I don't think we know how to recognize that we straight up are walking around here with PTSD. Yeah. What do you, and you know, you mentioned something about the nervous system and I know that you've done mm. quite a bit of work on that. Break down what that means. Cause I see people talking about that on the internet all the time. Like, oh, your nervous system is disrupted. What does that mean? Charlie Rob? Well, you know, after doing the work that I've been doing with Landmark, um, they have an, a course, it's called the advanced course. Mm-hmm. And in the advanced course, you actually go all the way back to find kind of like your winning formula, like usually between the ages of three and five, you know, something would have happened that kind of shaped who you are mm. like, for the rest of your life. Right. Mm-hmm. So I got in touch with, with, with that. And, um, and so then I, I recreated myself as being peace, healing and collaboration. Right. And so it was out of that, that I began to see, well, now I'm semi-retired. I was teaching. I'm ad- I, I forgot to tell you, I was an adjunct professor as well. Now that I did read that in your bio, right, right. That so you were adjunct for 14 years at Springfield College, the Milwaukee campus, and um, and I decided that, you know, when the campus kind of, it closed down actually because of COVID 19, and okay. I said, well, since I've been teaching for Springfield for 14, I should be able to teach for myself. What course? Heck yeah! But I launch for myself, right? Something will, of course, it will be in line with who I who I created myself to be. Yes. He's yes. Still in collaboration, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I was looking at, well, what, where can I have the most impact? And I thought, well, since we have a problem with, with, with people living together, sustaining relationships and parenting their children, like in the state mm. of Wisconsin, in the teenage category, only 7% of teenagers live with their biological parents. 7%. In the in the entire state? In the state and for black for black families. Okay. Okay. All right. So when I discovered you blended in black, yeah. I'm looking at, well, I mean, I can learn a lot just by listening to her comments and, yes. and the people, you know, because they're talking about their conflict, their trauma, their experience. Oof trying to mm-hmm. maintain and sustain relationships. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I thought, well, if I could have a major impact there, yes, I will, my life would be fulfilled. So I said, well, what I'm like gonna, this, I'm, I'm going to make this my mission. Right. Cause you know, I, I was a psych major and worked on a master's degree for school psychology. And I discovered what school psychologists were doing. I didn't want to do that. Right. Right. And I got the law degree. And then I did all the work that I did with Landmark since 1986. Mm-hmm. We, um, and I'm an instructional leader right now. I'm a program leader with Landmark right now. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what we do is we have a methodology for trans- having people transform their relationships in life. Okay. Right. And so I'm bringing that technology as well to this course that I'm creating. Are you, when is, is this a course that I can take right now? Because I'm interested. Wow. I, take, I wow. want to take it like today. Is it ready? Well, see, thank you. That that really helped my confidence. I haven't launched it yet. And I'm working on it for two years. I told you I was working oh, with that. Danielle on, Leslie has this program. Like Mr. Charles, hold on. I, I'm sorry. I called you Mr. Charles. Charlie Rob, yeah. when you first reached out to me, is this the course that you were talking about when you first reached out to me? Hold on. Let me go back to my email and see when the first time that we emailed. Because this has been more than two years. This is 2022. No, you need to be, sir, 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 sir. You should be embarrassed because I, I I don't feel like God, whatever you guys out there that are listening, call him, her, or they, um, I don't feel like God gives us these experiences and these visions to hold them to ourselves. Let me just look in my email real quick because I'm about to embarrass you. Hold on, because this don't make no damn sense right here. This don't make no damn sense. Well, man, my main problem was who do I market it to? Do I market it to people who are struggling as co-parents or do oh I focus on the faith-based community? Because I thought 
if I focus on a faith-based community, they will be natural partners in you know the mission of peace, healing, and collaboration. Right? You need to just hold on because I'm I, I just looked at my email. I have the the first one that I see is October 12, 2019 from Charles Robinson. What's this 2019? Three years, almost two years. So I'm sure it was before that that we we met before 2019. So I'm gonna say three and a half years. When can I take the course? Because you're telling me about my nervous system, and I need to be able to go back to when these first things were introduced into my nervous system, and how I can from ages three to five, and how I can go and reprogram myself. Clearly, this is something that the people need. We included. The last year, I've read about 17 books. That relates to and you ain't finished one course. What we're talking about, right? Because okay. I, want to, I want to deal with peace. I have like working experience dealing with peacemaking, like as mm-hmm. a mediator, because I have like over thirty years of experience as a family court mediator. That it makes- is hard to drill that down. I know it's so hard because you have all of this experience. It's very difficult to drill it down. Which for people like me, when I think of a course. I literally say, okay, let me put this succinct amount of information in here. And if I think of something later, I will build another course. But I need to get this out to the people right now, like with a sense of urgency, which is why I've done all the work that I've done. Cause you know, like, yeah. I'm yeah, a, you I, know what? After this, me and you are gonna sit and talk though. Like after this, what what but I want to learn more. I want to learn more. Can we just go back to how when you said you had you were traumatized, meaning you had PTSD. This means something in your nervous system was was thrown off. How does a person go about recalibrating their nervous system when they finally can identify that they they themselves have PTSD? What are we supposed to do about this? Well, you know, what I've been investigating is a mindful practice. And so I I actually been practicing for over a year right now with a group uh, mm-hmm. A group of for- graduates of the of the forum, the landmark forum, mm-hmm. and so I I uh, discovered I was coaching some people, performance coaching, who yeah. were actually being trained to be program leaders of the landmark. Okay, and one of them actually is a facilitator for mindful practice, right? So I discovered um, the benefit of practicing mindfully, and mm-hmm. also I read this book called Altered Traits. You Altered you may have written, you may have written the book. I mean, uh, I don't think uh, I'm familiar with that book. Emotional intelligence, Goldman, Goldman, emotional intelligence. Have you have you read that? Probably, or I probably, oh, I probably bought it and just yeah. never read it. Well, anyway, <laughs> so, I, he he co co authored with a guy named uh, Dr. Richard Davison from the University of Wisconsin a book mm-hmm. called Altered Traits. They studied the brains of monks who have been uh, meditating deeply. For, for years, right? So these are some peaceful, balanced dudes. And so their brains altered. Their brains reformed because of the meditation practice. So meditating can actually train change your brain oh and your God. mind. So the, the art of practicing mindfulness retrains our brain. So when we think of this trauma that all of us humans have inevitably endured, no matter if you're black, white, yellow, brown, like whatever. Um, we can do things to retrain our brains. So what does it look like then? Like, do you practice this every day? Because uh, I know day. about mindfulness. So you tell can join me what us. it looks like. You can join I want to join. It's free. You can join us. Um, join us. I'll send you the link. It's oh, you had me at free. What time? I'm there. <laughs> from 8.30 a.m. This is Central Standard Time. You come. Nine, That's fine. We, you know, we, we practice and then there's like 10 minutes after we practice and people share, if you choose to share, yeah. whatever your experience might've been. So then for those of us that, you know, obviously everybody listening, they can't come tomorrow. So what does it look like when you all, cause I want everybody to be able to close their eyes or work if they're driving, listen to this, if they're on the treadmill, I want them to be able to do it themselves tonight. So can you tell us, give us a real quick. With, with, with respect to the to what it is can you tell us what it is how to do it yeah well you sit in a comfortable 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 position mm-hmm. and it's basically breathing right it's it's all about deep breathing i have a an app on my telephone it's called mm-hmm. um is it the breathe app 
Well, no, it's it's a mindful app. You could do it with music or without music. You can time yourself for five minutes or mm-hmm. 10 minutes or half an hour. You can do it by yourself or you could do it with someone leading. Now, okay. if you have someone who's leading like a facilitator, they will like make sure that you come back because when you're practicing mindfulness, you have a tendency to go off. You can actually go off in yeah. a trance, go off because all of these um, thoughts, like um, it's almost like a cinema, like you're, yeah. all of these scenes going across your mental, mental screen Mm-hmm. And but we don't notice it when we're actively involved in life on a day to day basis. Right. But when you sit down and you breathe, you consciously you you focus on the breath and you actually you be in touch with all of these um, things, these thoughts. But they occur like a scene, like a movie. Yeah. Scene, right. Yeah. And so that's why I want to share with you to talk to you about the um, listening from within. Because yes. it was through practicing mindfulness, 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 yeah, that I actually got more in touch with that internal dialogue. And okay. see, when, when people can do that, when you practice on a day to day basis, you actually, um, the brain, the part of your brain that gets um, reformed is the part that deals with compassion, empathy, love, things like that. Whoa. And so that allows you to create space. And see, this is why I think this is a breakthrough because now that we know more and more about trauma, that trauma is handed down epigenetically, according mm. to Resma Menachem. Have you read the book? Hell yeah. I, now I read that. Anything I, on I epigenetics. Okay. Oh my God. That book. <laughs> oh, so y'all, those of you that are just listening, there's a book that I had to put it down. Some, you know, I had to put that book down a couple of times because I was like, shit. It's called my grandmother's hands. He just hold it, but hold it up real quick. It's called, oh, I can't. Okay. It's called my grandmother's hands. And it's such a powerful read for you, for me, for anybody. Um, you're probably going to have to put it away, put it down a couple of times. because it's going to hit you right here. You have to like, read it slowly. But there's you a, gotta if, read you read, slowly. if you read my grandmother's hands, you have to read the body keeps the score. Okay. And it's I'm pretty sure I've seen into, that. Or, the body keeps the score is a deeper dive and you have to read it slowly like, oh, because, God, I got so much work to do <laughs> well you know it's scientifically oh, I'm so screwed up it scientifically documents the body brain um, and mind connection the body brain and mind connection and it's scientifically documented how um what we experience is in our bodies like you ever get triggered and, and not really know what why you were triggered? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Well, well, that's because it, it all happens not just in the brain, but it happens in the body as well. According to Resma in his book, right. My Grandmother's Hands, right? He mm-hmm. talks about white trauma, black trauma, and then blue trauma, which is mm. trauma that police officers have when, you know, when they're interviewed after they've shot in, like an unarmed person and they don't mm. understand why, oh, it was because of the trauma in their bodies, which has been handed down up until, according to Resma, 14 generations, it could be handed down. 14 generations. So before we even take our first breath, we are already put here with the trauma, the trauma. epigenetics, you know, epigenetics. genetically <laughs> trauma is ingrained in our dna and so we don't know why we react to this thing we don't know why some of us are deathly afraid to go swimming or why we won't go near large bodies of water or why we stay away from certain foods so and practicing see, mm-hmm, and go sense, ahead. there are two or three homicides every night in the black community and that's just one city yeah and if you multiply that out you know, like people are are dying every night because they they got triggered and then their amygdala hijacked their frontal lobe, their 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 mm-hmm. executive part of their brain, right? Mm-hmm. It was actually commandeered, it was hijacked right. by, by the amygdala that caused them to do or say something that they're sorry for later. Like mm-hmm. road rage is a good example of that. And they are paying for it. Some of them with life sentences or their own lives have been taken because of a moment. And all that the people they're connected with, their families, their loved ones, they're traumatized as well. 
They're victims. They're yeah, society as a whole. And society as a whole, exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. then if we're talking mindfulness and the practice of coming back center, I know for a minute, me and Tony were doing this deep prox Chopra. He had like a seven day free um meditation. And so every oh, yeah. day we would wake up and he would ding the bell mm-hmm. and then he would use his very soft, let's take your mind into a place of, you know, like he would use the voice. Yeah. And so you know, when you were saying that cinematic thing, because, you know, like you said, when you're awake and the, you're going through your day, I've caught myself many times just ruminating on some dumb stuff mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and being like, Naja, come back to reality. Come back. But, you know, like you said, when you're practicing mindfulness, you're sitting there meditating. It pl- it literally plays out like a cinema, like a movie for you. Mm-hmm. Is that a healthy thing to happen, though, when you're well, meditating? When you do it and you're breathing and you're focusing on the breath. What happens is by practicing on a day-to-day basis, you actually develop the ability to pause between you, you act. Like something may trigger you during the course of your day, but yeah. because you've been practicing mindfully, you'll have the ability to pause before you act. You say, you know what? I'm not going to beat her ass right now. I'm going <laughs> I'm gonna breathe. And you know what? Neither one of us will face charges or have fines. I'm just going to walk away. Yeah. My amygdala, I'm in control of my amygdala. Mm-hmm. I am peaceful. I am balanced and I can walk away because it's not worth it. Mm. See, that's that internal dialogue. What yeah. you just did was you just <laughs> generated your own experience in life. Yeah, this thing, I have to do that every day. As Mr. Human Charlie being, Rob. As just think if, if human being human beings could generate their own experience in life by Mm. overriding the internal dialogue that's already always. See, we think our thoughts, we think we're controlling thinking. Yeah. But we really like we're on a school bus, like we're on a, on a ride. Mm. We, 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 we're on a thought having ride, but Mm -hmm. we call it thinking. So one of the things that we do in landmark is we have people distinguish thinking from listening okay so listening so it's like am i really in control um it so a lot of us actually think that we're in control and we think these are original thoughts but really these are things that were already predetermined for us and really we're just reacting is that what you're saying well we're listening and and we may act out of that internal dialogue that internal dialogue informs us from moment to moment how life is occurring for us. Mm -hmm. And there's a book that you got to read. It's called The Three Laws of Performance. And law You're giving me so many many books. Hold on. And as you're saying this, would you believe, look, I'm adding these books to my Amazon (laughs) cart right now. As you're telling me them, look, uh, here's, you see my phone? I'm adding them to my Amazon. (laughs) Yeah. So the three laws of performance. Right. Law one is guess what? What? People's actions are directly correlated to how things occur. I know it sounds uh, super sen- super simple, but your actions are directly uh, correlated to how things occur. Okay. It makes sense though, right? My actions are directly correlated. So that means I'm reacting because how things occur, that means there's happenings. And then my actions are directly re- correla- correlated. To so that means I'm reacting. To I don't want to just occur. react though. But listen, how things occur is in language. So the languaging process tells you how things occur. And then that's that's law two. And law three is future-based language can transform how things occur. Future-based language can- Like when you just said you could beat her ass later. Okay, (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so so you're looking at, well, I'm not gonna (laughs) act right now. Right, right. I'm gonna be rational about the situation. Yes. And I'm going to create something different for the future. Right. So yes. like, you didn't realize that you were actually overriding the already always listening. That we, mm-hmm. call, we, we call it thinking. But see, if, I, if, I, if I ask you to stop thinking, mm-hmm. you couldn't stop thinking. Right. Yeah. It's difficult to do that. OK. I don't think I could do that. You'll be thinking about that. Right. Yeah. I, I'll be thinking about not thinking. Right, exactly. So human beings do very little real thinking. Like the what we when we're really thinking, that's what we're we're probably engaged in 
critical thinking, critical right. thinking, which mm -hmm. is which is distinguished from the thought having process, where there's a already always listening mm -hmm. that we bring to every moment of life. So mm. like 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 when I showed up in your podcast, mm -hmm. so there was already always listening that affected how I'm being with you in the in the podcast. Okay. Right? And so when you showed up, there was already always listening for you too. Mm -hmm. So given whatever the situation you're in, you're going to bring this already always listening, which is based on your past experiences. Yes. What if I want to be different though? What if I, I, what if something has happened and I recognize like you can't be bringing your already always, you need to transition and transform this. Well, number one, something. you notice you have to notice that there is an internal dialogue that you don't control. Yeah. It, oh, yeah. It, it never stops. It, it's mm -hmm. ying, 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 ying. You know, it is always talking mm -hmm. and you are always listening. You, so you're, you're basically speaking to yourself and listening to yourself, speak to yourself. Right. And it's it never stops. OK. And it informs okay. you what's happening from moment to moment. However, it's hooked up to the past. So that's why the more things change, the more they stay the same. Because we, oh my goodness, yeah. We try to we try to solve problems, not fully being present, because we're stuck in the past trying to solve problems for the future. So what mm. we get, we get an extended past for a future. So we're running from the past into the past. Okay, see, so yeah, we don't know that. Too, you're going too fast for me. We're running from the past into the past, but, but we don't know that we're doing So that. we're like on a hamster wheel. Yeah. And, but when you notice that you are. It you know, because I don't want to be on a hamster wheel. I don't like that. It gives you the ability to pause and do something different. What was the other book? I know we talked about my grandmother's hands and in the three laws of performance. There was another book that you just you mentioned, and I, I didn't write that the down. The Body Keeps the Score. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, guys, I'm literally adding all this. I'm going to post it in my stories when these books come. And then Body alter keeps... traits, alter traits. If you're, you know, hey, hold on, this is four books you got me read. Please <laughs> hold on. No, no, hold on now. I, uh, well, alter wait. traits, alter. Well, yeah, they, and they're, you know, alter traits is kind of scientific because it's based on, you know, study. But if you're interested in how that mind body um, brain works, now, I didn't tell you about the vagus nerve. Tell me about that. The vagus nerve is attached like at the base of the brain. V-E-G-U-S? Vagus, V-A-G-U-S. Okay. Right. And it goes out and it attaches to the major organs. So like, have you ever had a bad thought and you feel bad? Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, that's because of the vagus nerve. And when that happens chronically, you could actually make yourself sick by thinking bad thoughts. Ooh, you can make yourself sick by thinking bad thoughts. Yeah. Chronically, you can give yourself a chronic illness. And we and that probably manifests with something called stress for a lot of us. Exactly. I'm going to send my PowerPoint. I have a PowerPoint. I did a PowerPoint in 2019. I mm -hmm. wasn't completely um, inactive. I did a power. <laughs> I did a workshop for three communities here in Milwaukee. And it was dealing with uh, violence uh, prevention and trauma. Mm -hmm. And I include, uh, you know, in that presentation, there were 50 people on a, on a Zoom call. And um, I can send you that PowerPoint. That right. is, is this that something thing. that, because there's so, I feel like we touched, we touched a little bit on so many deep topics like when i go back to listen to this podcast i'm gonna be like oh my god we should have dived more into the ptsd part or the epigenetics part or um so is this powerpoint is something that i could share with my audience because they love this stuff too oh yeah can i share it with them oh okay well, you know so i'm gonna i'm gonna mm -hmm. link it down below you all so that we can all like we can all learn because this is this is a lot yeah you're really such a wealth of information I really want access to your community. I want to be able to 
help them deal so with. So how about, I will give you, like, what did I tell you from day one? When I see, number one, I know that you've been consistent. And when I see that someone is being consistent and I have built the audience that I have, mm. my key job for building this audience is so that I can be the change in people's lives. But Naja doesn't know everything. But I'm so privileged to meet people like you that are willing to come in. So I would say this, I can speak for my audience. We would all, cause I'm going to be joining the class too. I would happily give you the floor and be like, listen, y'all, Charlie Rob is coming in and he's going to teach us about these things. And we'll all, we'll all come and bring our pens and pads and, and, See, and, I, had and to be deal, I had to deal with the single parent thing and the co-parent thing. Yes. I had to deal with that myself. And yes. I, I wish you could see my my Facebook, my daughter, you know, she put yeah. up thing, you know, because she went, you know, I was a single parent with her and she's always acknowledging me. She's a fitness. I remember me and you talked about that when we right. first spoke on the phone, because right. you yourself have dealt with co-parenting and, and all of the things that a lot of us are still going through right now. And blended you know, family too, because I, I was a stepdad, I was a stepdad. So you're going to have to come back and we're going to have to talk about like your real life. I'm so glad we got the overview today, but I feel like you're going to have to come back and, and tell us like about the, you know, the real life side of it, because we are actually out of time right now. I'm so sorry, guys. You know, guys, I I, I normally do these podcasts. Y'all know it's like 40 minutes, but it was just so much when some, when you have somebody on like this, I mean, I, I hope you guys kept up. And I'm going to literally link everything that he mentioned below. And I'm going to go ahead and link the books too, because I'm about to buy these books there. I just put them in my Amazon card. So um, Mr. Charles Robinson, tell everybody real quick um, exactly how they can find you. And guys, I will be posting the link below, but tell everybody how they can find you and connect with you. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, Charles L. Robinson, JD. Also uh, Facebook, Charles L. Robinson Sr. And um, I have a website, www.fatherhood-presence.com. And I have a private group, uh, hashtag Fatherhood Presence. Fatherhood Presence. And all of these will be linked below. Oh my goodness, you all. It's um, it's been a pl- It's been a pleasure. And I'm speaking on you all's behalf because y'all know I be talking for you guys all the time. But it's been such a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much for sharing your wealth of knowledge. We will all be listening. And I'm going to say this. It's not going to be the last time that you are going to be joining Naja Hall and the I Know I'm Crazy with Naja Hall audience because you're coming back to teach us. I'm I'm just going to hand you the microphone one day. I'm going to say just go off. So everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that you got some beautiful nuggets out of this. I know I did. I will see you guys. Tuesday after next, everywhere your favorite podcasts are streamed. Thank you so much for listening to I Know I'm Crazy with Naja Hall. I know I'm crazy. I know I'm crazy. I know I'm crazy. I know I'm crazy. Naja Hall.